Hi, I'm Alistair, and in this video, I'm going to walk you through a project that uses an Arduino or ESP32 to learn the remote control signals sent from fobs like these, and then replay them to be able to control wireless devices like these four plugs or this fog machine. So these use low power radio signals, which you often find on wireless consumer devices. Besides the two examples I've got here, you'll also find the same sort of system used on wireless doorbells, LED light controllers, motorized blinds, garage door openers, and lots of other devices. It's also the same technology used in more secure devices like car keys, but I'm not going to be describing how to clone these. So if you came here for that, you'll have to look elsewhere. But other than nicking cars, why might you want to clone RF signals from devices like these? Well, one reason is that it creates a backup. If you lose or break the original fob, but you've stored a copy of the code it sends, you can recode them and still access all their functionality. And you can also create your own universal controller, learning the codes to many different devices and controlling them all from one place. But the most useful part for me is that it allows you to automate and add smart control over otherwise dumb devices. This cheap fog machine, for example, requires manual operation, either using the remote key fob or by pressing this physical button. Now, a more expensive model might have had the ability to control it via a DMX signal, but this one doesn't have that. But I can DMX enable it by using an ESP32 to receive a DMX signal or a wireless signal over ArtNet or SACN and have that broadcast the code to the fog machine as if it had been pressed on the remote fob. And that means I can synchronize this to lights or music as part of a program sequence or trigger it when a sensor is activated. Now these power sockets are often used in escape rooms as a cheap and easy way for games masters to remotely release a maglock if players get stuck on a puzzle. So you have the power supply to your maglock routed through one of these plugs and the intention is for players to solve a puzzle and deactivate the maglock themselves. But if for whatever reason that doesn't work, the games master can remotely cut the power by using the key fob. But rather than having to operate the physical fob manually, you could learn and then send those remote release codes directly from an Arduino or ESP32, or even integrate the control of these plug sockets into your control software. So how do you go about doing that? Well, the first step is to capture the signal sent from the transmitter of the device you're trying to control. And to do that, you'll need an RF receiver module that operates at the same frequency. Now, depending on what country you're in, there may be regulations that only allow devices to use certain radio frequencies. And every device should state the frequency it uses. Here in the UK, most devices use 433 megahertz. Uh, elsewhere in Europe, it's sometimes 868 megahertz. Or in the US, it's normally 315 megahertz. If you look for a sticker on the back of the device or in the instructions, it will tell you what it uses. And then you need to make sure you have a receiver module that uses the same frequency as the device. Now, you can connect the output pin from the receiver module directly to the GPIO pin of an Arduino or ESP32 to listen on that frequency and then capture the signal associated with each command that's sent from the uh, transmitter. And you might think that that's as simple as just pressing each button on the controller and then capturing the pattern of high and low signals recorded on the input pin. And when I was researching this project, I found a few Arduino libraries that behaved just like that. But I found they didn't work very well because it's not quite that simple. There's radio signals and electromagnetic interference all around us. So any raw signal you detect from this receiver is really noisy. You might get uh, missed bits of data or you might get spikes. It's a little bit like if you try to read a floating button input without using a pull-up resistor, you'll get lots of false readings. And if you were to just capture and play back the raw recordings that you get from this module, you'll capture and play back all that noise as well as the signal. 
Now the intended device, the fog machine or the plug sockets, whatever, they know what signal they're expecting to receive from the transmitter. So they're able to filter out any noise added to the signal uh, sent from the original controller. But we don't know what's signal and what's noise. So we're going to have to do a little bit of manual detective work to identify the correct code amongst the noise. So here I've written an Arduino script that captures all of the data received from the module and outputs it to the serial monitor. And then I'm going to press one of the buttons on the transmitter that I want to capture. And the first thing to notice is that even when you only press the button once, it generates many codes in the output. And this is quite normal. One of the ways these systems are designed to be more resilient is that they don't just send the command once each time a button is pressed. They repeat the same signal several times, anywhere between 5 and 20 times for each button press. And that's to increase the chances that at least one of them is heard correctly. So when we look at the data of the signals received by the receiver module, you can see that some of them have been cut short, containing fewer bits than others. Although it's theoretically possible that the correct command code is 17 bits long, it's much more likely to be a whole number of bytes, i.e. a multiple of 8 bits. And we can see that there is a 24-bit code here. That's the longest code that appears in the output received, and it appears several times. So that seems like a pretty good candidate for the correct code that we're trying to capture. It appears to have received all the bits, it's a round number of bytes, and it's been repeated. So we'll note that code down, and then we can repeat this process for all the buttons which we want to learn on this device and for all the other devices. Once we've recorded them all, the best way to test if they're correct or not is to try rebroadcasting them. And for that, we're going to need a transmitter module. You can buy these RF modules in pairs with both a receiver and a transmitter. The receiver is the more rectangular one, whereas the transmitter is square. And you can see it has the radio frequency it uses printed on the resonator component here. This one is 433 megahertz. Now, just like the receiver, we can connect the data pin of the transmitter module to the GPIO pin of the Arduino, except this time we set that pin as a digital output that we're going to write high and low values to, corresponding to the codes that we captured with the receiver module. So here's my sender sketch, and at the top I've inserted all the different codes which I captured using the receiver module when I pressed button on the remote. Each command is stored as a three byte array expressed in hexadecimal format for convenience, but if you prefer, you can think of these as a 24 bit value consisting of binary zeros and ones. But we also need a little bit more data to fully describe this signal. It's not just the sequence of highs and lows, but the timing of those changes, the duration of each bit, the length of any separator. And that's what's recorded in all these additional columns of information in the receiver sketch. So the payload column, this gives the unique message that represents each individual command the remote sends as recognized by the receiver. Whereas the values in these columns, they describe the protocol that the device and its controller uses to encode this message. So these are the same, they're common values that are shared between all of the control signals. So in our sender sketch, I've included a library at the top which is called RF433Send, and I'm using its builder class to create a sender object from all of these timing values. If they differ slightly in the received values in the receiver sketch, I've just taken a simple average. And I've used that to create an object called TX device that replicates the way that the original controller behaved. You only need to do this once for each device you want to control. And then to send a message as if that controller would have done, I can call the send message of the TX device and pass in the unique three byte code of the command I want to send. 
Now in this sketch, I'm passing in different command codes based on values received over the serial connection, which means I can now use my laptop to control the four plug sockets and the smoke machine. But you could just as easily have these commands sent when a sensor input is detected or when a message received over a network or sent from Node-RED, etc. So that brings me to the end of this video about how you can capture the signals sent from wireless controllers such as these and then pick out the command signal from among the noise and rebroadcast that using an Arduino or other microcontroller as a way to add automation and smart control to well, basically any device that has a wireless remote such as one of these. Now, I did mention that in researching this project, I came across some existing Arduino libraries. There's a very popular one called RC Switch. And in many ways, that's actually a little bit simpler than the approach I demonstrated in this video, but that's because it works in a slightly different way. The way RC Switch works is that it detects the pattern that the receiver module hears from one of these remotes and then it matches it against a predefined set of templates that it knows about and so long as your remote uses one of those template patterns it works really well but if it doesn't it simply won't recognize it at all so i'm using a different library in the sketch here i'm using something called rc433ne by sebastian millet it's a little bit more complicated, a little bit more complex to understand, but it's more powerful and it gives you that really low level detail, the timing signals about the duration of the low and high pulses and the separator and whether the bits are inverted, things like that. And that really means that you can use it to clone any kind of wireless device. So if you wanted to implement this project yourself, I strongly recommend you check that library out. Now in terms of the specific implementation, which I demonstrate in this video, if you'd like to access the wiring diagram or the code which I wrote, I'll put those available to download either on my Patreon as a thank you to my Patreon supporters who enable me to create these tutorials every month. I really do appreciate your support, so thank you all very much. If you'd like to ask any questions or comments or suggestions on this video, you can always write them down below anyway, and I'll do my best to get back to you or you can join the Discord server and I'll put a link to that in the description. Otherwise, I just want to say thank you all very much for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, cheers, bye.